Hey there guys, my name is Siobhan Fallon. Welcome back to Custer's 7th Cavalry. You probably know that on June 25th, 1876, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer's second in command was a man named Major Marcus Reno. Reno survived the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And you probably have heard that a couple years later, there was a court of inquiry that examined whether Major Reno had any responsibility in the tragedy that unfurled that day. But did you know there were two other court marshals of Major Reno and they both involved young, beautiful, very social women of the regiment. Those women also had skeletons in the closet. So let's dig and find out a little bit more. Thanks guys. Marcus. Albert Reno was born in Carrollton, Illinois, and graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1857. He fought in the Civil War and served with distinction. He was injured at the Battle of Kelly's Ford in 1863 when his horse was shot out from under him. While he was on detached service in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, buying horses for the cavalry, he met his future wife, Mary Hannah Ross. She came from a very prominent family. Reno was 28. Mary Hannah was 18. She bore him a son they named Ross. Reno emerged from the Civil War as a brevet brigadier general of the volunteers, though his regular army rank was captain. For the next 10 years or so, Reno was on staff and detached duty, seeing no serious action in the field. Reno was promoted to Major of the 7th Cavalry in December 1868. Reno was in the field for a long scout in Kansas and Colorado in 1870. In 1872, he went to New York to join the board selecting a new weapon system. After 10 months, they chose the 1873 Model Springfield Carbine, which is what soldiers used during the Little Bighorn fight. Reno commanded the military escort that protected the Northern Boundary Survey Commission, and that mapped the boundary between the U.S. and Canada in the summer of 1873. Also on the survey were two D Company 7th Cavalry officers, whose names are going to come up quite a bit, Captain Thomas Weir and Lieutenant James Montgomery Bell. Then Reno took a six month leave in October 1873 until May of 1874, as his mother in law had died and his wife, Mary Hannah, took ill with kidney disease. Reno returned to the boundary survey again in May of 1874, and it was two months later when he was on that duty that he received a telegram telling him that his wife, Mary Hannah, had died. He was not granted leave to return to Harrisburg until late September 1874. He missed his wife's funeral. Reno then took his 10-year-old son Ross to Europe and Russia. He was away from the 7th Cavalry on this vacation for nearly a year. So you can see that Reno missed every one of the 7th Cavalry's and Custer's fights with the Sioux and Cheyenne and most of the 7th Cavalry headline events. Reno missed the Battle of the Washita, the Yellowstone Expedition, and the Expedition to the Black Hills. Reno arrived at Fort Abraham Lincoln, assuming command on November 1st, 1875. Now he assumed command because Colonel Sam Sturgis, the actual commander of the 7th Cavalry, was on detached service and Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer had just gone on leave to New York. In Sturgis's and Custer's absence, Reno was tasked with getting the companies at Fort Abraham Lincoln ready for a coming summer campaign in support of President Ulysses Grant's ultimatum that ordered all roaming Plains Indians to move onto the reservations. So while Reno had been a member of the 7th for nearly eight years before the Battle of the Little Bighorn, he had served with a limited number of members of the 7th Cavalry during this time. He wasn't the only one. When the 7th Cavalry rode out of Fort Abraham Lincoln on May 17, 1876, it was the first time all 12 companies were united on campaign. Companies of the 7th Cavalry were often on detached service in support 
support of other units and missions. For example, many of them had spent prolonged periods of time in the South on reconstruction duty at places such as Shreveport, Louisiana. June 25th, 1876. The Seventh Cavalry, who had been given all the best guides from General Alfred Terry and Colonel John Gibbon's command, tracked the growing number of Indians. On the fateful morning of June 25th, Custer, fearing that the Sioux and Cheyenne had seen them, ordered an attack. Custer told Reno, who was second in command that day, the Indians are about two and a half miles away on the jump. Follow them as fast as you can and charge them wherever you find them and we will support you. Major Reno, after crossing the Little Bighorn River, proceeded down the valley with companies M, A, and G. As Reno grew closer to the villages and saw the Indians were not retreating, he sent two messengers to Custer, but he didn't receive a message from Custer in return. Reno had about 165 men with him. He was convinced the Indians were planning an ambush. Reno halted the charge and threw out a skirmish line. The skirmish line did not last long before the soldiers began to accumulate in the timber to the right. Soon after this, a volley killed the Indian scout Bloody Knife and wounded a soldier. Reno convinced the Indians had infiltrated the timber, told his men to mount, then dismount, then mount again, and he shouted, Men, we are surrounded. Draw your revolvers and follow me. There were no trumpet calls signaling the retreat, and many soldiers were not aware of an order to leave the timber. Reno, at the very front of his fleeing column, led the men across the Little Bighorn River and up to the bluffs. During this retreat, more than 30 men were killed. Many soldiers were wounded, and at least a dozen men had been left behind in the timber. Now earlier that day, Captain Frederick Benteen had been sent off on a scout by Custer. When Reno reached the top of the bluffs after his retreat, he was met by Captain Benteen and Benteen's column who had returned to the main trail. Immediately, Benteen showed Reno the final order he'd received from Custer. Come on, be quick, big village, bring packs. But Reno said, for God's sakes, Benteen, halt your command and help me. I've lost half my men. So Benteen remained with Reno. After an hour or two, depending on the witness, Reno and Benteen finally went toward Custer, halting at a set of peaks known today as Weir Peaks or Weir Point. There, within view of Last Stand Hill, they stopped, thinking Custer's fight was over. With the approach of the victorious warrior force from Custer's battlefield, they turned around and returned to the original bluff known today as Reno Benteen Hill. The fight there lasted until the following day. On June 27th, General Terry and Colonel Gibbon's column arrived and told Reno and Benteen and the survivors of the 7th that Custer and his entire column had been killed. On June 28th, the survivors buried the bodies of more than 260 of their comrades and closest friends. Reno would describe it as, quote, a harrowing sight of dead bodies crowning the height on which Custer fell and which will remain vividly in my memory until death. The seventh continued their summer campaign. In late July, Edward S. Godfrey records some incidences with Reno that foreshadows what's ahead. Reno was placed in arrest by General Gibbon. And the next day, Godfrey wrote, Colonel Reno got a copy of charges against him. It all comes from Colonel Reno sending out scouts as vedettes Saturday evening after we got into camp. I presume, however, Colonel Reno's manner has as much to do with the results as his manner is rather aggressive. And in mid-August, Godfrey will mention Reno again in his diary, saying, Major Reno has been playing ass right along and is so taken with his own importance that he thinks he can snip everyone and insult his staff. So there's not anyone on the personal staff on speaking terms. <laughs> 
Two days later, Godfrey says Reno's, quote, self-important rudeness makes him unbearable. Meanwhile, there had been rumors spreading about Reno's role at the Little Bighorn. Thomas Rosser, who had been a Confederate general during the war and also a friend to Custer and a surveyor who traveled with the 7th Cavalry in 1873, published an explosive letter in the paper that said, I feel Custer would have succeeded had Reno made any effort. Instead of as soon as he encountered heavy resistance, Reno took refuge in the hills and abandoned Custer and his gallant comrades to their fate. Rosser was not the only military man critical of Reno. Lieutenant Ernest Garlington, a recent com recently commissioned West Point grad who joined the 7th, later wrote, the Battle of the Little Bighorn has been fought a month before I joined, and of course was still the subject of conversation and comment. There seemed to be a suppressed feeling, at least among a portion of the officers of the 7th Cavalry, that Major Reno had not met the trying emergency suddenly thrust upon him with the most heroic spirit. The 7th Cavalry spent 131 days in the field. The campaign was one long and dismal failure. As Captain Thomas Weir remarked to a reporter in the Chicago Times on September 16, 1876, as the Sioux have failed to find us, we are going home. On September 26, the 7th returned to Fort Abraham Lincoln. Reno, in the absence of Colonel Sturgis, who was still on detached duty, and with Custer, of course, dead, was now the acting commander of the 7th Cavalry. That same night they returned, at the trader's post, a fight broke out. Reno overheard a young infantryman, Lieutenant John A. Manley, mention the Thomas Rosser letters to the paper, and Manley agreed with Rosser's assessment of the fight. Reno and Manley came to blows over it. Charles Varnum and Thomas Weir tried to break up the fight. Reno called for pistols, and under the threat of arrest, the argument finally broke up and the men left. But this fight will come up later. On December 17, 1876, Reno assumed command of Fort Abercrombie, Dakota Territory. Now, December 1879 was probably not a very joyous one for Reno. On December 9th, Frederick Whitaker's biography on George Armstrong Custer hit the shelves. And the biggest takeaway of this 600 page book was, the massacre at the Little Bighorn was due to Reno's cowardice and Ben Jean's indifference. The book was widely reviewed and discussed and surely known to the entire military community. Fort Abercrombie was a pretty desolate post. There was a small town, Macaulayville, across the Red River in Minnesota. Fargo was about 30 miles to the north. Reno arrived in the middle of winter, and we are talking North Dakota and Minnesota winter, so it's pretty darn cold. Abercrombie was also an older fort, and it had nearly reached its expiration date. It had been an important post for settlers and miners before the Civil War and had been instrumental in putting down the Minnesota Uprising in 1862, but the Army had not been updating it and the fort would be abandoned in 1877. Fort Abercrombie was the home of Company A, 17th Infantry, as well as Company F, 7th Cavalry, commanded by Captain James Montgomery Bell. James Bell had fought during the Civil War with the Pennsylvania Cavalry. He had been a member of the 7th since it was first created in 1866. He was the quartermaster during the Battle of the Washita, and he actually rode in during the thick of the fight, bringing the ammunition wagons to the 7th Cav when they were about to run out of ammo and be potentially overrun by the much greater Southern Cheyenne and Native American forces. In 1872, Bell married Emily Mary Hones on Emily's 21st birthday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Emily was a London-born beauty 13 years his junior. Emily's family had moved to America when she was six in order to escape bankruptcy in England. Her father became a brewer in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. 
Newspaper accounts describe Emily Bell as having a vivacious disposition and being a general favorite of the officers and their wives, and a woman of more than ordinary beauty. James Bell was a member of Captain Thomas Weir's D Company, and in this capacity, he joined the Northern Boundary Survey Commission, which Major Reno, if you remember, led. Together, the Bells had been at Shreveport, Louisiana, with companies B and G from the fall of 1874 until the spring of 1876. In March 1876, Bell took a six-month leave of absence, and he missed the Little Bighorn campaign. There were some comments about him being a, quote, coffee cooler because of this. The Bells arrived at Fort Abercrombie in November 1876. Reno went to Abercrombie on December 17th. On the day Reno arrived, he dined with Captain and Mrs. Bell and another family. That night, Bell learned his father was ill and he immediately left for Pennsylvania. The trouble soon started after that. After her husband left, Reno visited Mrs. Bell repeatedly. One day he visited her in the morning. Then he asked her to go for a carriage ride in the afternoon. And then he went to her home that evening. When he got there that night, Lieutenant Herbert Slocum was reading to her. Slocum left and if, after a few minutes, and Reno stayed for two hours. According to Mrs. Bell, when she was walking Reno to the door, he took her by both hands and pulled her toward him. She pulled her hands away. He again took her hand and moved it up his arm. She asked him if this was the Mason handshake, and he said yes, and that he had a book about it back at his quarters if she wanted to read it. She said she only wanted to read that book if it was really about masonry. Reno left. A couple of nights later, Mrs. Bell said Reno called again for a brief visit. After he left, Mrs. Bell went outside to see her neighbors. Reno was still on her shared porch, and when she turned around to close the door behind her, he put his arms around her waist. She twisted out of his arms and said, Major Reno, don't you do that again? And he laughed and said, there is no harm in it. And she repeated, don't you do that again. She immediately went into her neighbor's home and told her about the incident and later told other wives on post about it as well. Mrs. Bell also adamantly said she would never invite Reno into her home again. Reno apparently did not realize how much he upset her as he kept inviting Mrs. Bell to accompany him to different events and she kept declining. On Christmas Day, Mrs. Bell hosted a Christmas party. She did not invite Reno. That night, he drank alone at the Suitler's and he told the bartender, this means war. I'll make it hot for her as she has thrown down the gauntlet. And he certainly did. On December 29th, a visiting preacher, Reverend Richard Wainwright, came to Abercrombie to perform church services for the holiday. Wainwright had been invited to stay at the Bell's residence by Captain Bell before Bell knew he would be absent. As Wainwright was about to enter the fort, Reno met him and asked him to stay at his quarters instead without mentioning any difficulties he'd been having with Mrs. Bell. Reverend Wainwright, himself married, said he ought to stay with the Bells as that had been the plan. Reno was not pleased. Over the next few days, Reno continued to try to convince Wainwright to stay with him, telling him at one point, Mrs. Bell's reputation is like a spoiled egg, your own good name, the welfare of the church and the good of the service all demand you leave Mrs. Bell's. Reno also said she was a, quote, notorious character in the regiment and that several officers had repeatedly asked him to expel her from the regiment. Wainwright spoke to other officers to tell them what was happening and ask their advice. He ended up writing a letter to Major Bell, sorry, to Major Reno, saying he just couldn't leave Mrs. Bell's, as now he was afraid it would be seen as a slight against Captain Bell. Reno's final act occurred, fittingly enough, on the last day of the year. The holiday church service was held in the library 
on December 31st, and usually these services were attended by the officers, some enlisted men, and a few people from the nearby town of Macaulayville. Mrs. Bell was supposed to play the organ. Reno sent his adjutant, Lieutenant William W. Robinson, to the library to inform the gathered officers that the organ could be played during the service, but not by Mrs. Bell. Robinson said that, quote, services will be stopped if Mrs. Bell attempted to play. <laughs> when services started, Mrs. Bell still moved toward the front of the room to sit at the organ, and Robinson approached her, telling her again what Major Reno had said. No one else played the organ. The service was performed without any music. But after this, Reverend Wainwright moved into the home of another family, and Mrs. Bell sent for her husband immediately. Captain Bell returned on January 5th, and with Wainwright went to see Major Reno. Reno denied ever saying anything against Mrs. Bell. Captain Bell preferred charges against Major Reno for, quote, conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. Reno was relieved of command of Fort Abercrombie and put in arrest. And in early March 1877, his court-martial trial began in St. Paul, which was the headquarters of the Department of the Dakotas. Reno hired two civilian lawyers to help him or to defend him, one of whom was a prominent politician in Minnesota who would go on to be a U.S. senator. The defense's case was an attempt to try and prove that Mrs. Bell had a social vendetta against Major Reno. Mrs. Bell took the stand, as did Wainwright, Slocum, and Robinson, as well as the traitor bartender who testified that Reno said he would make it hot for Mrs. Bell and that he would drive her out of the regiment. Reno's defense called three 7th Cavalry officers, Major Lewis Merrill, Captain Frederick Benteen, and Lieutenant George Wallace. The defense claimed that Reno as a commander knew Mrs. Bell's character, and thus in order to maintain good order, he had a right to prevent Reverend Rainroy from staying with her. Major Merrill, who had been the commanding officer of the companies of the 7th Cavalry in Shreveport, Louisiana, testified that Mrs. Bell's character had been subject to, quote, rather unfavorable criticism. Frederick Benteen got on the stand and testified that Reno's character was, quote, first rate and that Mrs. Bell's reputation was indeed bad. Years later, Benteen, who had something negative to say about pretty much everyone in the 7th Cavalry, would write of Major and Mrs. Bell. Major Bell is a massive, fine-looking fellow, but I have no doubt the Madame soon learned that her brain matter contained more gray matter than did his. She doubtless was a nymphomaniac. Benteen also hinted that Emily had an affair with 7th Cavalry Officer Lieutenant Benny Hodgson while in Shreveport, Louisiana. Benteen wrote, is it within the bounds of possibilities that Major Bell could not scent out the musky missteps of his madame? Little Benny H. told me on the shady side of a Montana bluff in 1876 that when he got away from that Louisiana town, he felt that the weight of a mountain had been removed from his shoulders. I didn't ask him if he hunted the musky fox. He, as a gentleman, would not have told me. George Wallace testified that Reno's character, quote, has been very good. But of Mrs. Bell, Wallace gave the most damning testimony of all, saying she, quote, was not a true wife. The judge advocate or prosecutor stated that Mrs. Bell's reputation was not on trial, and he also reminded the court that if indeed she was such a person devoid of character, a person whose reputation could not be further injured, then what was Reno, the post commander, doing at her quarters so constantly? Major Marcus Reno was found guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman, and the original punishment was that he was to be dismissed from service. 
the Secretary of War wrote, quote, Major Reno's conduct toward the wife of an absent officer and in using the whole force of his power as commanding officer of the post to gratify his resentment against her cannot be too strongly condemned. However, President Rutherford B. Hayes mitigated the punishment from dismissal down to a suspension from rank and pay for two years. Some historians have found this to be harsh punishment. Now, I might not know what it's like living at a frontier post in the late 1870s, but I'm a military spouse and I understand military culture. Reno was not an inexperienced and young enlisted man. He was not a second lieutenant fresh out of West Point. He was the commanding officer. He was the highest ranking officer at Fort Abercrombie. He was the boss. Every member of the military there had to call him sir. Major Reno not only made unwelcome advances on a fellow officer's wife, then he spread rumors about her and did everything in his power to make her life miserable. We talked about this briefly in the beginning. Don't forget, these soldiers and officers, they're always moving around. They were sent on campaigns that lasted for months and months. They were sent on detached service. They had to leave their families for long periods of time. The judges and members of the court who decided on that guilty verdict were the officers themselves, and most of them were married. There would be times they too had to leave their wives and daughters alone and vulnerable. And you just can't have a post commander whom you can't trust around your women. Reno left the Dakotas and moved into a hotel in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to wait out his two year suspension. Bell, Robinson and Slocum and Company F were transferred to Fort Abraham Lincoln in April. They never returned to Fort Abercrombie and the fort was soon abandoned. Even though Reno was far from his 7th Cavalry colleagues, his troubles, though, did not end, which brings us to new charges brought against Reno. Remember the barroom fight I mentioned on the night the 7th Cavalry returned to Fort Abraham Lincoln after that horrible summer campaign? It was September 26, 1876. Well, on May 28, 1877, Lieutenant William Robinson proffered charges against Reno. A little bit more on Robinson. He had been Reno's adjutant at Fort Abercrombie. Robinson had been in the third calf with General Crook on in the March Powder River expedition, but his battalion didn't go with Colonel Reynolds in that attack. Robinson was transferred to the seventh calf after Little Bighorn. He took Lieutenant Benny Hodgson's spot in Company B. And then he was promoted to first lieutenant and transferred to F Company. A request was submitted that Reno be charged with drunkenness on duty regarding that September 26th fight. That while he was in command of Fort Abraham Lincoln, and while he was intoxicated, he was guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman and had engaged in a, quote, fisticuff and rough and tumble fight with Lieutenant John A. Manley. I'm just gonna read these charges because they're hysterical. Quote, Major Marcus Reno did roll on the floor of the officer's club room in the slops and filth covered by spittle and the spilling of liquor over said floor to the disgrace of civilians and junior officers. In addition to this physical altercation with Lieutenant Manley, when Charles Varnum tried to break up the fight Reno started arguing with Varnum and assumed the attitude of a duel. He asked for pistols when Captain Thomas Weir tried to soothe this over and have Reno and Varnum shake. Reno hit the hand of Varnum away from him saying, don't you touch my hands. When Lieutenant Robinson said he would have to place Reno under arrest if he brought pistols into the traitors, Reno shouted at him, who the hell are you? <laughs> However, when Colonel Sam Sturgis, the commander of the 7th Cavalry, re received these late charges, they're more than six months after the fact. Sturgis disproved them, saying they seemed to be motivated by, quote, bad grace. Though Sturgis may have regretted that decision, as we shall see.
This brings us to the Reno Court of Inquiry held in Chicago in 1879. Now, those of you who have watched my videos, and I have quite a few of them, know all about this. Reno may have had a little too much time on his hands during his two year suspension from service after the incident with Mrs. Bell. He's the one who requested this court of inquiry. He was provoked by the Pulp Fiction writer, Frederick Whitaker, who had written an autobiography, sorry, who had written a biography about George Custer. And Whitaker in this book and in accusations, he also made in articles and letters to the papers, placed the blame of Custer's defeat on Reno's shoulders. Whitaker was not the only one. Reno hoped a public investigation would put all of the accusations of cowardice to rest. The results did not put an end to the criticism. Reno was found not guilty, but the testimony of the officers was not always a vote of confidence. Excerpts for the testimony of these two officers, except, sorry, for the testimony of these two officers, whose names are gonna be a little familiar, Captain Frederick Benteen, and Lieutenant George Wallace. They agreed with Reno on the major points his defense made, especially that George Custer did not have a plan of attack and that they did not hear Custer's guns in the distance. Others were less enthusiastic in regards to Reno's behavior at the Little Bighorn. The court ruled on March 11th, 1879, the conduct of the officers throughout was excellent, and while subordinates in some instances did more for the safety of the command by brilliant displays of courage than Major Reno, there was nothing in his conduct which requires amnia aversion from this court. Please, guys, check out my videos on the Reno Court of Inquiry if you want more details. I have an entire playlist. I think the Reno Court of Inquiry is key to understanding June 25th, 1876. Reno's suspension ended on May 1st, 1879. Then he was assigned to Fort Meade and he was second in command. The commander was Colonel Sam Sturgis. Fort Meade was the new regimental headquarters of the 7th Cavalry and with the companies A, C, G, E, H, M, as well as the field staff and the regimental band. There were also two companies of the 1st Infantry stationed there. In early August, the 1st of Reno's problems manifested themselves. He was having dinner at the post trader's home with a couple of other officers. All of them were drinking, but Reno began to slur his speech and hiccup in a way that made the trader's wife, Mrs. Fanshawe, afraid he was gonna be sick. And she asked her husband to stop giving Reno liquor. A few days later at the officer club room, Reno was playing billards and he deliberately broke a window with a chair. He did pay for the damages, but when the bartender gave him his change, he hid it out of the bartender's hands. So the bartender picked up the change off the floor and he tried to give it to Reno again. And once more, Reno hid it out of the guy's hands. A few weeks after that, on October 25th, Reno was playing pool with second Lieutenant William Nicholson. Reno lost heavily. Nicholson and Reno began to argue about the amount of money that Reno owed the younger man. Nicholson started shouting at Reno, saying he could lick him in two minutes any way he wanted. Reno responded by trying to hit the second lieutenant in the head with a pool stick. He, Nicholson threw up his hands and the pool stick broke over his arm. Nicholson then leapt at Reno and the two had to be pulled apart by other officers in the room. When Colonel Sturgis heard about yet another fight, he charged Reno with conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. Reno was put under arrest and confined to the post. About two weeks later, even before this court martial began on the night of November 9th, 1879, Reno would do something even more unwise. As we mentioned earlier, Colonel Sturgis was the post commander at Fort Meade. He actually arrived in mid July, 1879. So he got there two months after Reno. Sturgis brought his family with him. His wife, Jerusha, his daughter, Ella, who was 21, his son, Sam Jr., who was 18, and his 14 year old daughter, Mary. The Sturgis family 
had recently lost two sons. One is, of course, Lieutenant Jack Sturgis, who at the age of 22 died with Custer at the Little Bighorn. But before that, the baby of the family, Thomas, who had been only five years old, had died in May 1875. Ella was an accomplished and talented young woman. A newspaper described her as, quote, a very handsome girl, tall, slender, with large, expressive gray eyes, dark skin, and hair and marked eyebrows, with color enough to make her brunette beauty effective. Besides losing her brother at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, she also lost the dashing young man who was thought to have been courting her at the time, Lieutenant William Van Wick Riley. I have a video on him, guys. Even more recently, Ella had broken up with her fiance, Second Lieutenant Charles M. Caro. Caro was a West Point class of 1878 graduate and a member of the 7th Cavalry. He was also known to be a heavy drinker. He met Ella at Fort Abraham Lincoln and they fell in love. Colonel Sturgis did not approve. He sent Ella to St. Louis in order to separate the two lovers. Caro requested sick leave and followed her to St. Louis. In May 1879, she sent him a letter ending their relationship entirely. The next day, Caro, alone in his hotel room, shot himself in the head. So Ella was dealing with quite a bit of personal drama herself. Ella Sturgis was 21 years old. Reno was 44. He was more than twice her age. As we mentioned, Ella had plenty of suitors. She had the doomed love affair with a dashing William Riley, as well as Charles Caro, who killed himself for love. A few years later, she would marry a rich young banker, and when he died, she married a chairman of a railroad company. Reno came with a lot of baggage, and whether the Sturgis family thought he was in any way to blame for the Custer disaster, or maybe Jack Sturgis's death, the military community was rife with rumors and gossip about him, about the Little Bighorn, as well as his earlier court-martial about his behavior toward Mrs. Bell. Though Reno was second in command, it doesn't seem like Reno spent any time socially with the Sturgis family. There was one day, October 1st, Reno had paid an unexpected visit to the Sturgis house while Colonel Sturgis was out. Reno stayed for two hours. Sturgis would later angrily say that Reno had not followed proper social etiquette. And he had not sent in his name, but just knocked and entered the house. <laughs> Sturgis would also say his family was certainly not on cordial visiting relations with Reno. At about 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night, on the evening of November 9th, 1879, Reno went for a walk. He passed near Colonel Sturgis's house. Now remember, he's under arrest for court-martial for fighting with Nicholson. And as an officer under arrest and awaiting court-martial, he's forbidden to visit his commanding officer. Yet Reno spotted Ella sitting inside one of the rooms on the side of the house. So he decided to walk across the yard to this window he raised himself up on his toes and looked in. Ella Sturgis, fully clothed, heard what sounded like tapping and she looked up. She began shouting, Mama, it's Major Reno. Mama, it's Major Reno. Mrs. Sturgis shouted for the Colonel who came downstairs, grabbed his cane and ran out of the house. Reno was already gone. Colonel Sturgis sent Lieutenant Ernest Garlington, the post adjutant, to Reno's home. Reno was promptly confined to his quarters. Reno wrote an apology to Mrs. Sturgis the next day, asking her pardon, saying, I said to myself, can there be any harm in looking in? No one will know. And in my loneliness and thoughts of the past, I felt myself impatient to resist the temptation. Well, he wasn't pardoned. Instead, Colonel Sturgis preferred an additional charge to the court-martial specifications, another one 
for conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. Finally, the court-martial. The prosecutor called Lieutenant Nicholson, the traitor and his wife, that's Mrs. and Mr. Fanshawe, and others to testify about Reno's bad behavior. But of course, the most explosive testimony came from Colonel Sturgis and Ella herself. Ella was called to the stand and recounted what happened that night while she was in the parlor. I said, mother, there's someone at the window. When I sat forward and looked out into the darkness, I saw a face gradually appear. I sat paralyzed as my eyes met Major Reno's. He evidently saw no one in the room but myself. His eyes were fixed on mine. I was so frightened. I could not move and was only able to say, it is Major Reno, it is Major Reno. When I first said it, my mother said, no, it is not as if it could not possibly be true. But when she saw the state I was in, she said, Ella, run! But I could not move. And it was only when I heard mother leave the room calling for my father that I had strength enough to get out of the chair and run to the corner, which was between the fireplace and the front window. His face was immediately against the pane, and I saw Major Reno for perhaps six seconds. My impression was that I would be shot for I knew he must have feelings against my father, and as his face was very pale, and he looked as if he was about to do something very desperate, very excited, and his expression was one of anger, as if to threaten. Reno's defense called once more for Captain Frederick Benteen. Benteen said Reno had read him the note of apology that he had sent the next day. Benteen also asserted that Reno was, quote, dead in love with the young lady. Reno's defense claimed that Reno's conduct had not been unbecoming an officer and a gentleman, but claimed his behavior was due to, quote, the youthful follies or trivial deviations from rectitude. Well, the court did not agree. Once more, Major Reno was found guilty. Of the charges of drunkenness and pertaining to his bar fight with Lieutenant Nicholson, the court found him guilty, but they amended the seriousness of that charge, downgrading it from conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman to that of conduct to the prejudice of good order and military discipline. Now, if this had been the entirety of his court-martial, he would have probably only served another suspension but it was the charge of peeking in at Ella that ended his career. On that charge, he was found guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman, and the mandatory sentence was that he be dismissed from the military service of the United States. There was some debate about whether Reno ought to be again shown leniency and suspended rather than dismissed, President Rutherhood, Rutherford B. Hayes wrote, the sentence in the foregoing case of Major Marcus Reno, 7th Cavalry, is confirmed. So no leniency this time. Starting on April 1st, 1880, Reno ceased to be an officer of the United States Army. Reno would later say, it has been my misfortune to have attained a widespread notor notoriety throughout the country by means of the press, open to any enemies who know not why they are so, but like the village cur, bark when their fellows do. And a greater degree of attention will be called to what I do than other officers not so widely advertised. Reno would fight to be reinstated in the army for the rest of his life. But that, my friends, is a story for another day. For more on the life of Major Reno, please watch my video biography on him, as well as Lieutenant William Riley and Lieutenant Benjamin Hodgkin. I have a whole series of 7th Cavalry Officer bios, so check them out, please. Thanks, guys. Uh, like, subscribe, click your notification bell, leave me a comment, come back real soon. Thanks for watching, and thanks to my friends for helping me out. All right, thank you.